Hello, we're back. This is Elder Gail with you and also with me is missionary Reverend Willie Klingscales, my mentor and trainer. He trained me in the area of missions and he was with us on our first trip to the Philippines and I think a couple of trips to the Philippines uh, and uh, is very familiar with you and, and we're both excited about being here. Uh, uh, I, I have been tasked today with, uh, Pastor mentioned it kind of in passing, the doctrine of providence, the providence of God. And that's what I'll be talking about today. It's really a huge subject to cover, to try to even attempt to cover in an hour, but we're going to try to, I'm going to try to, uh, but I'm gonna do it a little differently rather than, um, I'm gonna do it by looking at the life of someone who's an example or who uh, the, 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 the providence was evident in his life and that's, that's Joseph. But before we start, let's pray. Father God, I thank you for this opportunity to be with these Filipino pastors, folk that I got to know over the years and that we have relationship with. Lord God, do a work in our hearts during this session and during this entire conference. May they come away, Lord God, having been so in your presence that they, Lord God, are ready, ready, Lord God, to reignite them, give them new fire, give them an excitement for what they do, cause people who see them after this to know that they have been in your presence. May you fill them afresh and anew. May they have a new vision for doing the work that you've called them to. I ask you for it all in the name of Jesus. And I ask you even during this session to show them a, a glimpse of your providence that it might steady them and they know that you're in control and they need not worry. So thank you in Jesus's name, amen. We're going to be, like I said, we're going to be talking about the providence of God. And you might be asking yourself, well, what's so special or why do we need to even look at the providence of God? And, uh, and I was reading something and I thought it said it so well. Uh, it's the Belgic Confession. Uh, and it, it gave a great explanation for, for what we get or what we see in, in the doctrine of providence. And it says in explaining why, why find out about it? Why inquire about it? Why study about it? And it says this doctrine, the doctrine of providence affords unspeakable consolation. It consoles you since it teaches us that nothing can befall us, nothing can happen to us by chance, but by the direction of the most gracious Heavenly Father who watches over us with a parental care, keeping all creatures so under his power that not a hair on our head, for they are all numbered, nor a sparrow can fall to the ground without the will of our Father, in whom we do entirely trust being persuaded that he so restrains, listen to this, he so restrains the devil and all of our enemies that without his will and permission, they cannot harm us. That, that kind of makes you, you know, just kind of shout that this is what we learn in the, in the doctrine of providence we learn that God is in control, that he's in control of all things. So let me 
that get to a little bit of, of uh, the providence and what the word providence and providence means. Providence is made up of, of pro, 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 uh, pro, uh, <laughs> provide and ints, the, the beginning, provide and ints. And then provide is made up of two sections, pro, which means before or, or in front of, and uh, uh, the, the provide, the vide means to see. So the, you put provide together and it means to see before, to see uh, ahead. And so you're saying, well, well, you know, provide and, and to see that doesn't maybe make, seem to make sense how something to see ahead or to see before would, would mean to provide for, for us or to look after us. So let me give you uh, an example to kind of help you understand what this whole idea of seeing and how it is related to providing uh, through the example of Abraham. You will remember in, in Genesis 22 that God told Abraham to take your son, your only son, Isaac, or take him up into the mountain and sacrifice him. And, and Abraham is obedient. He gets up the next morning. He takes Isaac up to the mountain and Isaac looks to his father. And he says, well, we got the wood. We got all of the utensils that we need to, to, to make a sacrifice. But, but daddy, where's the lamb? And Abraham says to him, God will provide for himself the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. That word provide there in the Hebrew means to see. It actually translates, God will see for himself a lamb. So how is this to see and to provide related? Providence means to supply what is needed, to provide something, to give sustenance or support. So what is this seeing thing? How is that related to provision? In God's economy and in the, and in the Jewish, Jewish uh, culture, God just never sees something and, and that's it. God doesn't just see something and then forget it. Anytime he sees, he acts. He's a God of action. Uh, God is not a, pa a, a passive participant. You know, he's, he's not so, uh, a God who's, uh, he's hands-on. That's, that's a, the, the term I'm, I'm thinking of. He's not a mere spectator. Uh, when God is when God is watching over what He sees, He then responds to. He, he doesn't ignore it. Whatever, wherever God is looking, He is also acting. In other words, the word providence doesn't me merely mean to know before or to see before or foreknowledge. It also relates to God's active involvement in his creation, in his world, in the universe. God is actively involved. And so let me give you the formal definition for providence. Providence is that continued, and, and all of these words matter, continued exercise of, 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 of God's energy is continued because there's some people who do something one time and they don't continue it. But for God, it's this is the way he's always is. And what is he doing continually? He's preserving all of his creatures. The, the, the word of God talks about how in him we live and move and we have our being. He preserves all of his creatures. He, he, he's the one who sustains us and causes us to live and to remain alive. 
He is operative, hear that word, operative in all that comes to pass in the world. Nothing occurs without God's involvement. And then he is directing everything that happens towards his destinated, appointed end. You, you might be thinking in terms of, what is it, Jeremiah 29, where God says he knows his thoughts towards us, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to bring us a future and a hope. And some translations translate that to bring us to an expected end. God has a purpose according to his divine will. And according to that purpose, his, he destines things to happen according to his will. And all of that is his providence. All of that is a part or, or portion of his providence. In other words, God is in control. And nothing happens except through him and by his will. Providence then equals the active sustenance and governance of the universe. The, the sustaining of the universe and the controlling uh, of the universe is in God's hands. So when God sees, he sees to provide. He, he is, his seeing is always with the view of doing. God's providence is seeing to the universe. So, we're going to look at, like I said, this whole issue of providence from the vantage point of one life, Joseph, Jacob's son, and let you see God's providence at work in a life. We're gonna look at it, we're gonna, we're gonna do kind of like they do in the movies. You know, in the movies, sometimes you go into a movie and and uh, at the beginning of the movie, instead of it happening se sequentially, you see the end of the movie, and then the remainder of the movie shows you how they got to the point of, of the ending. So we're gonna start at the end. We're gonna start at what was God's appointed end. What was God after? in the life of Joseph. What did he want to accomplish through Joseph's life? We're gonna start there. And that appointed in the destiny that God wanted to reach, his goal that we find in Genesis 50, 15 through 20. And I'm gonna read that to you. It says, uh, this is after Jacob dies. And it says, when Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, what if Joseph bears a grudge against us and pays us back in full for the wrong which we did to him? So they sent a message to Joseph saying, your father charged before he died saying, thus you shall say to Joseph, please forgive, I beg you, the transgression of your brothers and their sin for they did you wrong. And now please forgive the transgressions uh, of, of the servants of God, of your father. And Joseph wept when they spoke to him. Then his brothers also came and fell down before him and said, behold, we are your servants. You, we, we, you, need, to see, you need to see this. They're so worried because they know they have mistreated him and they're worried, you know, that Joseph had been kind to them, but they've been figuring, well, he's just kind because daddy was still around. Daddy was alive. And so therefore, you know, he didn't do anything to us. But now that Jacob's dead, they're afraid that he's gonna take out his revenge 
and he's going to get them back for everything that they had done. So, so they're worried. First, they send him a message. Then they're still concerned. And they go and they fall down before him and say, we'll be your servants. We'll even be your slaves. And in fact, they, that they, they knew that that's what they deserved. But I want you to see what God's expected end was in, in the life of Joseph. He said, but Joseph said to them, do not be afraid. For am I in God's place? As for you, you meant evil against me. But God meant it for good in order to bring about this present result to preserve many people alive. I, Joseph is one of my, one of my favorite biblical characters, I have, to, I have to admit. God had a plan for Joseph, the person, the individual, and God had a plan for the, the Israelites, for, for the Jews, for Israel. Number one, what God, God planned to do through Joseph would keep Israel alive. Well, number one, we're seeing God's providence already because God knew something that nobody else knew, that there would be a famine. And so he is, he's orchestrated all of history or, the, or this history at this particular time to deal with the fact that there would be a famine and he knew there would be a famine. And so therefore, everything that happens to Joseph is to save, as Joseph says in, in this last verse, many people alive. If the famine had occurred, and none of this had happened, Israel would have been destroyed. They would have all died out as a result of the famine. So what God does in his providence, in God seeing before, and, and, and let me add on that before part, because that before part is important. God not only sees before, as in he sees you know, before yesterday, the word of God tells us God saw before the foundation of the earth. God saw before there were any people, before he, you even existed, before uh, he even talks about him knowing you and me and, and he knowing all of us before we were in our mother's wombs, before we were knit together in our mother's wombs. So God not only sees, sees, something and responds, sees something and goes into action. God sees it way before. God sees it uh, because of his wisdom and him being omniscient, him knowing all things. He sees it all and he responds. He responds uh, in, in, in working out history. He, he, look at all the things that, that God had to do in order for this to work and for his providence to be real in this situation. Number one, well, first of all, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, all of them had to be born and all of that had to occur for finally, for Joseph to be born at the time that he was born. For, for, for him to be born in that generation when the famine would occur. All of that is part of God's providence and evidence of God's working, God's seeing, and then responding to what he sees and him putting some things into, in place. It, it's evidence of God's control. So we, we, we just looked at the end of the story that, 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 that uh, Joseph died. Uh, not Joseph died. Jacob died. Joseph is not holding it against them. He realizes that because of God, because of God's kindness towards them and his goodness, he's preserved Israel from death. So we see the end. So, but how did he get there? 
How did Joseph get to the point at the end? How did we get to God's expected end? It's a huge story that, start, that starts out in Genesis 35. But it's interesting. Uh, I want to add, uh, there's, there's a writer, uh, I think he's one of pastor's favorites, Flavel, who talks about the fact that when we stand before God and, and we, we look and we talk to God about our lives and, 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 and we start talking about, well, I, I, I was sick at this point and this happened and, and I lost my money and I lost my job. And you, you go through all of these scenarios about various things that happen in your life. And Flavel says, and God will tell you, every last one of them, every high point, every low point, every challenge, every victory, all of it was needed in order for you to become the person that God wanted you to be so that you would be standing there in his presence. How did, they, how did Joseph arrive at that destination, that final place God wanted him to be? This is the route. In the beginning, in, in Genesis 35, we see Joseph and he's 17 years old, just a kid. And what we're told right off the bat is that his father loved him more than any of the other sons. So much so that he made him a coat of many colors. And don't you know, while that might've been nice for Joseph, the other brothers were extremely jealous and they did not like it. And the, and the word talks about the fact that as a result, they hated Joseph. This is the beginning of the story. They hated Joseph. In fact, Genesis 35 talks about the fact that they didn't even talk to him. Can you imagine being raised in a household and you have brothers and they're not even interacting with you. They're not talking to you. You're, you're, you're lonely in your own family. And then to add insult to injury, he has a dream. He has a dream and the, and, 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 and the dream infers that his brothers, first dreams that his brothers will be bowing before him. And that angered them to no end. You know, who are you? You, 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 you want, we wanted the baby brothers. We're the older brothers. In Jewish culture, an older brother would never bow down to a younger brother. So they were, they, they, they were incensed that, about this dream. And then Joseph has another dream where the sun, moon, and stars bow down. So not only are the brothers bowing down, but his daddy, his parents are bowing down to him. But Jacob hears it. I mean, it upsets him, but he kind of just ponders on it because he, you know, he kind of holds it in his heart because he kind of knows God can do some mysterious kinds of things. So he lives under these conditions of not being liked, of being kind of lonely in his own household. And his dad one day sends him out while his brothers are tending the livestock and they see him afar off. And they say, here comes the dreamer and his brothers plot to kill him. But Reuben, the oldest brother, intervenes and says, let's just throw him in a pit. His idea was that he would eventually intervene and he would get Joseph out 
and everything would be okay. But just as it happens, Providence again, some slave sellers were coming by some, 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 uh, and they purchased Joseph for 20 pieces of silver. Wow. Uh, in fact, it was done. Judah was the big one who was saying, let's, let's just sell him. We can make some money off him. Why kill him when we can make some money off of this deal? So they sell Joseph. And Reuben is heartbroken when he discovers that Joseph isn't in the pit, that he's been sold. So now we have Joseph enslaved. Wow. So he sold to the slavers. So he's enslaved and the slavers take him to Egypt. All part of God's plan. That was the whole plan in the first place to get Joseph to Egypt. And they sell Joseph to the head of, 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 of Pharaoh's guards, bodyguards, Potiphar. And the first positive thing happens to Joseph in all of this, he finds favor. Potiphar puts him over everything. In fact, in fact the, the Bible says that the only thing that Potiphar knew about was when it was time to eat. And he'd sit down before his meal. But other than that, Joseph ran the house. Joseph did it all. He did everything. And so he had great favor. So if, if it looks like finally things are looking up. There's some positive things going on. Then Mrs. Potiphar makes advances towards Joseph. The word of God says that Joseph was handsome. He was good looking. And Mrs. Potiphar kept, kept trying to put herself on him. And he would say, no, I can't do this. I, uh, your husband has entrusted me with this entire household. He's withheld nothing from me except you because you're his wife. But she kept bothering him. One day they're in the house alone while he's working. And, and, and she, she makes advances again. And he runs out and he's trying to get out of there so fast that he leaves his coat. And she uses the evidence of the coat as proof and tells everyone that he, that he tried to uh, attack her, that he, was, he tried to rape her. And Joseph is put in jail. So now he's imprisoned. But again, he gets favor. Providence again. He gets favor with the jailer, the head of the jailer. And they put him in charge of the jail. Boy, I mean, this guy's, this guy's something else. No matter, <laughs> there's some things that we'll, we'll, we'll talk about it when we finally get through all this. But just to see that no matter what happened, to Joseph, God was still with him. God was still favoring him. God could cause him to receive favor even in the midst of a jail. So it happens that once again, it just so happens by coincidence, uh, Pharaoh uh, has, a, has it out with two of his staff, a baker, and a cupbearer, and they're put in jail. And both of them have a dream. 
You know, we, we saw about that Joseph and those dreams when he was a boy. And they have a dream that disturbs them. And Joseph eventually interprets both dreams. He tells the cupbearer, you're going, to, you're going to be called back to the palace and you'll once again have your old job back and all will be well. The baker hearing such good news says, well, well, tell me about my dream. And so he tells him his dream and he tells him, you're gonna be behead, you're gonna have your head taken from you. Uh, you're going to die. You're going to be executed. And both of the, those interpretations were accurate. It happened just as Joseph said. And Joseph asked the cupbearer, when you get back to the palace, remember me. Don't forget, don't forget, but remember what I did for you. Remember what I said. But another disappointment, Genesis 40, 23, the cup bearer forgot about Joseph. And Two years passed. Two years of, of knowing that you're in jail for something that you did not do. You've done a favor for the cupbearer. He hasn't remembered you. And then Pharaoh has a dream. And when Pharaoh has a dream that no one can interpret, the cupbearer remembers a Hebrew man in the jail with him who interpreted his dream accurately and tells Pharaoh. They call Pharaoh, uh, Joseph to Pharaoh. Pharaoh tells Joseph his dream. Joseph tells him the interpretation of the dream. He receives honor from Pharaoh, favor from Pharaoh. Pharaoh gives him his daughter to be his wife and he is promoted to second in the kingdom, in the nation. Uh, the only person higher in rank in Egypt is Pharaoh himself. It took to get God's expected end, to get to that point, it took him being hated by his brothers. It took him being thrown in a pit, being sold into slavery, being then working as a slave, then being falsely accused by a woman who claimed he attacked her, being placed in jail, being forgotten by someone who, whose, whose dream he had interpreted to finally get to that place of God's expected end, the thing that God wanted to happen. When we first saw Joseph, how old was he? 17. When Joseph stood before Pharaoh, he was 30 years old, 13 years. We always want things to happen quickly. When we have a, a dream or a vision or we have a design or a desire to do something, even, even our works for the Lord, we're hoping that it will happen quickly. We're hoping that things will come to pass in a short time frame. But it took Joseph 13 years to move from that place where we initially saw him to that place, not a place that, you know, that he was even seeking for, but to the place where God wanted him. 
It wasn't a quick fix. It wasn't, it wasn't a, you're here today and there tomorrow. It took some time. But in the meantime, when we see Joseph in Genesis 50, 15 through 20, when we see this man who is not holding a grudge against his brothers, we see this man who's forgiven. God has so worked in Joseph through all of these experiences that he has a heart towards God. He has a heart towards his brothers. And, and God has done a work in him. In order for us to become the people that, that God wants us to be, we're going to have to go through some things. That is, uh, I, I, I wish I could say that we you know we can have all these positive and great experiences and we'll grow in God. But the truth is, most of your growth is going to come through suffering. Most of, of, of the character building, most of, of, of God's developing his integrity in you is going to come through uncomfortable situations, not through these positive things. You remember Jesus said he learned obedience by what he what? By what he suffered. And the route, you know, we hear in, in math and when you're in school, it says the, 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 the quickest route is a straight line. But unfortunately, our lives aren't straight lines. God doesn't normally take us through straight lines. We have some crooked places and some hills and some valleys and, and all of it is necessary to bring us to God that expected in that God has for us. God knew that there would be a family by his foreknowledge. He knew when it would occur. And by his providence, Joseph was born at the right time to address that issue, to be the instrument that God would use. What were you born to address? What's going on in the Philippines that God designed you, that God made you, that God has put certain things in you, that you would be in a position to address them, that you would be in a position to represent God in your village, to represent, to represent God in Mindanao, that you would be the one who could say, thus saith the Lord. You would be one who would have character, you would be one that, that, that people would look at you and say that, that, that person represents God. That person is a man or woman of God. Why are you living right now? Why of all the various generations that God could have caused you to be born in, are you living right now? God has placed something inside of you that this generation needs. God has given you gifts that can be used for his glory in this generation where you are. It's not coincidence that you're who you are, that you're where you are, that, that all of, of, of certain, the justice things came together for Joseph. Just as specific things came together and Joseph had certain skills, a certain skill set and God enabled him to do certain things. And, 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 and do you notice that when Joseph stands before Pharaoh and Pharaoh says, I understand you can interpret dreams. You know, that's usually the time when most folk want to come say, well, yeah, I, I'm, a, I'm a dream interpreter. 
But he doesn't say that. He says, interpretation of dreams is with the Lord. Only he has that skill set. But he will enable me to do it. He gives God glory. He gives God credit. God's calling you and I, God's calling us to be that kind of person that when we're placed or uh, when he, we're called to the palace or when we're called into special places that we won't try to represent ourselves, we will represent him. You see, when we look at our lives, the individual things that happen in our lives, the, the, the each scene of our life, it's normally not possible to figure out or, or we may not, it may not even seem like God is at work. You know, when your baby's sick and you lose your job and, and you have all of these things happening in your life, it's oftentimes hard to see how God is going to use that for his glory. It's often difficult to see, you know, Lord, what's your expected end where, where it relates to this? How, how are you going to receive glory from any of this? But God says in Romans 8, 28, and we know that all things work together for good to them who love the Lord and who are called according to his purpose. When we give our hearts and our lives to the Lord, we are called according to his purpose. We are his. We are objects of his love. And we love him. So we can be confident that all things work together for good. The good, the bad, the ugly, the painful, all of those things, everything that touches our lives work together for good. One of my one of my Bible hero, well, not my Bible hero. She, she's just, she's not in, in the Bible, but as a young girl, I, I love to read. And uh, I would read about uh, Corey Tim Boom. And uh, she and her, her family during the Holocaust, during, during um, Nazi Germany, they hid Jews in their house. And as a result, they were arrested and they were put in concentration camps. And she hid a Bible. She managed to get a Bible, sneak a Bible into the concentration camp. And in that particular camp, if you had a Bible and the guards found out, they'd kill you. They'd kill you on the spot. But no one ever came into her, that barracks where she was. You know why? It had lice and rats. By God's providence, something as minuscule as lice was used for her to keep a Bible and she ended up sharing the gospel with tons of folk, leading people to the Lord in the middle of a concentration camp because of the presence of lice. God can use anything, any person, any situation for his glory, for those who love the Lord. God has held back nothing. You're the object of his love. He loved you so much that Jesus went to the cross. 
and he's asking us or he's desiring us. What is God's expected in for us? His expected in for you and I is that we might be conformed into the very image of Jesus Christ, that we would look like him, that when we stand before the Father, ultimately, we will resemble Christ. We will have the mind of Christ. We'll think like him. We will have the integrity and character of Christ. I'm reading a book right now. Uh, it's about pastors who've fallen and pastors who've had issues. And it says, unfortunately, the thing so often uh, when God is trying to work something in our lives that we try to skirt it and we never let him continue to build his character within us. And in order for us to stand in an hour like the one in which we live, we're gonna have to have God the character. Charisma is not enough. Popularity is not enough. The only thing that will support us and enable us to stand in the midst of a pandemic and the age in which we live, the times that pastor has just been talking about is that we possess the heart, mind and character of Christ and that we are continually allowing him to change us we are seeking for him to do, do in us what we ourselves cannot do. Look at the life of Joseph. He surrendered and submitted himself to God's working in his life. Submit yourself into the hands of God. Submit yourself to the hands of God and allow him, even in the rough times, even in the stuff you don't understand, even in the situations that are so hard that you're sitting there saying, oh God, why? But allow him, walk with him through those hard times. He has promised in in the 23rd Psalm that he will walk with you through the valley of the shadow of death. We can have confidence of God's providence, of his providential care over our lives. We can have confidence in the fact that God loves us with an everlasting love. We can have confidence in our ability to stand in the midst of a pandemic, in the midst of wars and rumors of wars, in the midst of a, of a violent generation, in the midst of everything that's going on. Why? Because our God is a providential God and he is in control, not the circumstances. I don't care what it looks like. God is in control. And to what extent is he in control? What is he in control over? He's in control over the whole universe. He's in control. He's sustaining all things by the word of his power. He's in control of, the, of all physical things, the seas and the trees and and, and every, everything that you see physically on earth, God's in control of it. He's in control of the affairs of the nations. Yes, they may be doing something in, uh, uh, in Ukraine. Yes, we may be hearing about what Russia is doing and what this, this, this nation is doing. 
But we're told in the word of God that the heart of the king is like a spray and God can point it and turn it however he wants. If you ever had a water hose and you turn it and you water your garden or whatever, God says he, the king's heart is like that for him. And he can just turn it however he wants. God is ultimately in control. God is ultimately in control of us. Every human being on the earth, all 7 billion people who are presently on earth, he chose when they would live, where they would be born, when they would die, what nationality they would be. Every aspect, he knew that I would be African-American. He knew what my skin color would be, what my eye color would be. God is in control of our DNA. He's a providential God. The word of God even says he's in control of our successes and our failures. He said, don't look to the, to, to the, to the, to the, to the, the east or the west or from the south, but what? Promotion comes from God. He's a judge. He exalts one. He raises one up and he brings another down. God is in control. He is in control. He protects, he protects the righteous. He provides, he gives provision for us. He provides answers to our prayers. He controls that. God is in control of everything. So then you, well, then you might be thinking, well, Elder Gail, if God is in control, well, Am I a robot? Am I a, a, a avatar or, or, or something? Do, do I have, no, you, you, God is in control without infringing on your liberties. You still make decisions. I mean, look at it. Jacob still preferred Joseph. Wasn't the right thing him to love one son and treat one son differently from the other but God didn't change it for doing it but God used it for his glory and it doesn't change us from having responsibility when we do something wrong we're responsible for it and we'll have to give an account for it He's also responsible for exposure, exposure and punishment of the wicked. Eventually, those who align themselves against God will have to answer. God is in control. I, I, when I read, was it Psalms 2? And they, they talk about the, how the, the nations rise up against God. And God, God does, you know, God doesn't get worried. He doesn't get concerned. He doesn't even think about it. He just, he just laughs. Because he knows who he is and he knows he's in control. And he's calling us to know who he is. To know who he's in control. I know the last two years have been challenging. So many things happening. But I pray that God will just even give you newfound strength and, and new, just refresh you and revitalize you during this, this time of our studying together in his word. I, I, I pray that you was, will see that you even got a glimpse just even during this short talk of his providence and the fact that he's in control. And 
I'm not saying that not something by saying that that nothing negative will ever happen to you. Yes, yeah, some things are going to happen. You can guarantee it. But even in the midst of things happening, God is in control. And just as he gave Joseph favor and just as his presence with Joseph was known and evident, his presence will be known and evident with you. My mother's favorite song mother went home to be with the Lord in 2013. But her favorite song is one that uh, I think is um, fitting for today as we close. It's uh, the, the title of the song is My Heavenly Father Watches Over Me. That's the whole crux of the doctrine of providence that our heavenly father watches over me says, I trust in God. And I can't see the words <laughs> and I know it, but right now I can't, I can't remember where they are. You want oh, me to read it? Yes, thank you, Sandra. I trust in God wherever I may be upon the land or on the stormy sea. Let come what may from day to day, He's a friend that always near to me. He walks with me all through the night and the day. He hears my prayer. He hears me when I pray. I trust in God. I know he cares for me. On mountain break or on the stormy sea, though billows roll, he keeps my soul. My heavenly father watches over me. I hope those words that your heavenly father, my heavenly father, watches over us, will be, will, 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 will bring, what's that thing that, that, that the, uh, the Beltic uh, confession said at the beginning, will bring consolation to your soul, to your heart, as you know you're not alone, that God's comforting you, God's there. Father, thank you for this time. Thank you for this time in your presence. And I pray, oh Lord, that you would do a work in each of our hearts, that you would open our eyes to see that you are with us, that you are watching over us, that we need not fear what's going on in the world because you are in control and through the good, the bad and the ugly, you are with us. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you for keeping us. Thank you for taking care of us. Thank you, Lord God, for every life and every pastor who's represented here, God. Give them, Lord God, newfound strength. Give them, God, new encouragement. Give them, God, a new tenacity to leave this conference and to go forth in your name with boldness and confidence that their heavenly Father watches over them. Thank you, God. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you for all you are to us. And thank you for watching over us. In Jesus' name, amen. Elder Clink. <laughs>